Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming. This is an amazing turnout, um, and what an awesome place this is. Um, today, I'm going to take about 20 minutes to talk about whether we should be saying mercantile or mercantile, and then we'll <laughs> move on from there. Um, so I've had a chance to work with John in a couple different capacities, and I just know how excited he is about this place, and I would encourage all of you to soak it in um, and use this. Uh, he's, he's really throwing it open. Um, uh, I'm trying to, one of the things I'm talking about today is how everything speaks and a place like this has unique things to say. Uh, and the fact that he's thrown it open to us and said, do things here, please use this place, uh, says a lot about him. So, so hopefully we take him up on that. Um, Steve from Wordsworth, I don't know where you went, but uh, thanks for the poem and uh, I didn't know that they were going to be doing poetry before I talked, but I'll touch on poetry a little bit. Um, but thanks for making this possible. Um, hopefully this turnout is reflective of a lot of New Year's resolutions and everybody's going to be showing up the rest of the year. I'm, I'm fairly new to Creative Mornings, and so I hope to, uh, to see you all a lot. So everyone is a lot of things at any given time and has a lot of things going. Um, what I guess I would have to call my profession is notoriously difficult to describe uh, for a few reasons. One is that it's relatively new. There's me. Um, there's no real track for it, and the name itself is contentious and incomplete. Um, the name that many people have landed on is graphic facilitator. Uh, sometimes people say graphic recorder or scribe. Uh, sometimes they say sketchnoter or doodler and many other things, but I'm going to stop there in these hallowed uh, halls. Uh, I say incomplete because historically the work has been situated within a larger collaboration capability, so supporting uh, collaborative events towards some end with scribing and visuals. Um, typically you'd have a team of facilitators and designers working to make sense of complexity uh, and systems and to help others work toward greater social understanding, uh, both as an end in itself and also towards some particular set of objectives. So in that capacity, I'm part of a company called Depict, there we are. Uh, Kelvy on the left, Sita in the middle, and me on the right, they're in Massachusetts. We're also all members of the Value Web, uh, which is an international nonprofit association based in Switzerland, basically focused on multi-sector, multi-stakeholder collaboration in transformational uh, projects for a more sustainable, equitable world. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we do and, and what that is. Um, I'm going to burn through a lot of other things that I'm involved with and that I do because it provides some context for how I'm coming into language. Uh, I'm proud to be one of the founders of Chase Public, as Jeremy mentioned. Uh, we're a nonprofit space for art and assembly in Northside. I'm working with a small bunch of people to launch the Academy of United States Presidential Scholars. Uh, I very occasionally write critical cultural pieces for High Low Brow and with a good friend uh, at Alabama about video games. Um, it's been a while, but I used to do capoeira in Boston. That's not me. Um, one day I thought I would be doing amazing things like this. Uh, some dreams die. And um, I still think about coming back to filmmaking. That is me on the left. Um, before that, I was a shot putter. Can you believe that? Look at me. Um, I was serious about Latin and classical studies for a while, uh, and there's my family. Sorry, honey, I didn't tell you I was going to put that picture of you. She's wearing the same shirt today, so you can find her. <laughs> when she was getting dressed, I'm like, should I tell her? So, sorry, honey. Um, so I'm saying all this because it's complicated. My relationship to language, as I'm sure is true for many of you, or all of you, it's complicated. Uh, so when Jeremy and Maxine asked if I'd be up for speaking about language, my head started spinning because there's so many different ways to approach it. Uh, and as many of you would probably do, uh, my head went to kind of a scan function. How do, I, how do I think about this from every angle first? 
uh, and then kind of winnow things down and get to some sort of uh, an idea about things and, and some particular point of view. So I started a Google Doc, and for a couple of weeks, whenever anything struck me as possibly relevant, uh, I made a note of it. So when Henry, uh, one of my five-year-olds, was choosing not to share some little Lego pieces with Miles, our four-year-old, uh, Miles screamed, Dad, Henry's not gimme in them. <laughs> and I was like, hmm, interesting, Miles. So you're saying gimme in them. So gimme is the root morpheme here, and n and m, so give me ing them. That's very interesting. So I put that in the document. Um, <laughs> And then we were watching the original Star Wars, and Matthew, who's also five, asked why Luke was switching off his targeting computer. And I thought how differently that act would have read in 1977 compared to now, when we all have cell phones. And I thought, use the force, Luke, is basically saying don't text and drive, um, <laughs> which works still. So, so I was like, I think that's about creativity and language. I better put it in the doc. So everything kept kind of going in this document. Um, so I'll get to those and, and kind of what I synthesize that down to in a minute. Um, a couple points about language first. So it's kind of amazing, but the way kids learn language is um, the opposite of forced. So leading scholars believe, and this is still a bit contentious, but they think there's structure in your head that as soon as you're exposed to all of this language data, you start picking it up naturally. Um, and so what that means for what people are is pretty powerful. Um, and this is only done through social interaction. So this isn't something where you can uh, sit and learn on your own. This happens through contact with people, and it happens naturally. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that it's useful to think of language as alive. So uh, languages are born, they die, they evolve, um, they mix with each other and create new things. Uh, so everything I'm talking about today, if, if you're able to kind of make that shift in your head of thinking about language not as something that's static that we use uh, as a tool, um, but that is something that's kind of living along with us. Cool. So the directions that I came up with, um, what emerged. So a lot of the history of what I'm calling my profession is intertwined with uh, a practice and body of work that's evolved over the years itself um, due to the input of hundreds of people over the whole world. Um, but a lot of it began with the work of Matt and Gail Taylor. Uh, they're in Louisville now, but it's a fascinating story um, that if you ever want to hear, I will tell you. Uh, they came up with a lot of useful models and axioms, which they called things that you can't necessarily prove but that you know to be true. Uh, one of which is that uh, creativity is the process of eliminating options, and some of you have probably heard me say that before. Uh, one of the models that they refer back to a lot is called the vantage points model. Uh, very quickly, here's a, a silly little exercise. So everybody, if you would, just point your fingers up to the ceiling, thank you, and start making little clockwise circles. So clockwise circles. Okay. Everybody see it? Clockwise? Okay. So now bring it down, keep moving. Okay. Now look at it like this. Okay. Did you switch your finger? Okay. So, right? Whoa! So, <laughs> so everything depends on your point of view. Um, so suddenly, looking at it from the other side, it becomes counterclockwise. So the universe, the universe does not look at this and say, this is clockwise, but you do from where you're, sti from where you're sitting. So the vantage points model is uh, a nice way of looking at that through language. So we have tasks, logistics, tactics, strategy, policy, culture, and philosophy. So I'm going to use this as kind of a frame for talking through the different ways that language and creativity might intersect. Um, the first has to do with how people who identify as creatives communicate. Um, and for me, that, that falls in this kind of area of task logistics and tactics. This is, this is lower level. Um, so to that point, uh, here's a little scene. And, and as I said, everything speaks. So here's a, here's a little uh, screenplay. And I'll, I'll just read this through. Um, exterior day. Mike, and, uh, Midwest Highway, Mike, Anita, his mother, and Marie, Anita's mother, drive I-94 on a beautiful Wisconsin summer afternoon. It is 80 degrees and sunny. Mike drives Anita in the passenger seat, window down. Mike notices that Marie in back looks a little chilled. Mike says, Mom, I think Graham might be a little cold. Anita says, Mom, you want me to put my window up? Marie says, No. Anita raises her window. So there's a lot of ways this could go. And so there's something uh, in acting called the contentless scene. And the idea is that as an actor, you bring content to it. And it's not about the words. Um, 
so I'll just quickly kind of go through what this felt like as I was driving. So uh, I'm looking in the rearview mirror and I see my grandmother kind of doing that. And I go, Mom, I think Grant looks a little cold. And she goes, Mom, you want me to put my window up? And my grandmother in back goes, no. And my mom goes, ah, and raises the window. <laughs> so there's history there. They love each other tremendously. They're fantastic people. But there's history there and context. There's tone and there's body language. Um, so there's way more to this than just the words. Um, so for me, that says, and this, this is something I scribed uh, a professional speaker talking about the importance of everything surrounding your words. Um, and so for creatives, uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, how are you communicating with people? What are you conscious of? What are you trying to do? And specifically, if words, if your vocabulary is something like your illustrated toolbox or your design principles or even how you interact with clients, uh, what's all the stuff that surrounds that? What is, what is body language to that vocabulary? What is tone to that vocabulary? Um, so just hopefully something practical there to, to ask yourself. Okay. Next, my creative journey. So the idea here is um, I thought I might just share a little bit about a couple of efforts I've been involved with and how language itself uh, tends to become this, this thread that connects things. Um, Short order poetry. So Chase Public is a nonprofit space for art and assembly in Northside. Um, our signature event is called Short Order Poetry. And the idea is that we talk with people. It's amazing how similar this is to what Steve shared. We talk with people. We ask them what they'd like their poem to be about. Uh, we take some notes and we quickly type something up for them. Um, so this is something that the writer could not do on their own. It's something that the person very often does not do on their own for whatever reason. Um, and it's an amazing, uh, empathetic gesture. It's always a gift from our point of view. So even if somebody sponsors it, um, it becomes an exchange that is about co-creation and it creates a new relationship. Um, what was really cool about this this past year, and many of you are aware of this, but Artworks was able to work with us. Uh, and we created this enormous project called Cincy Inc. from this. So the writers took all of these poems, hundreds of poems, um, reworked them, talked with each other about them, created new writing. Uh, and it really was this radical view of uh, creativity and ownership, specifically. So uh, nobody felt that what they were doing, what they were working on, was specifically theirs. Uh, and that was so amazing to be a part of. Um, it, was, it was months and months of very hard work, but it created something that none of us could have done on our own. It's something that we all felt was ours at the end. And we tried to do it uh, for and with the city. Um, and it became big. It got projected on buildings. It got uh, thrown up at the baseball stadium. It was, uh, it was everywhere, which was really amazing. Um, so whiteboards. Whiteboards themselves have their own language. Uh, everything speaks. And so this, this is like a typical work gig for me. It was like a blue collar company, really amazing. They have a very different view on things than like say a government might. Uh, but this is like a 40 foot wall and I got to talk with people who manage warehouses and figure out what's on their shelves. Um, and I asked them a lot of questions and worked with a bunch of people to kind of get to some view or some image of what they're worried about. Um, visually, this is interesting to me. There's, there's something here that you can't get, again, on my own. Um, there's something uh, temporary about this, dry erase itself. Um, it's not permanent. You know that it's, it's about ideas and something that you've just come up with and that could, it's going to be gone very soon. Uh, I had a an architect came up to me on a session one time, and he kind of took me aside and he put his arm around me and he said, he, very quietly, he was like, kid, uh, when you get tired of drawing things that get erased and you want to make something permanent, come talk to me. <laughs> so it's like, really? It's like, yeah, you're right. I've never made anything that's still here. Um, and what's interesting about this to me is that it, it became uh, an aesthetic direction. Um, and so I, I explored that with a couple paintings of, of different varieties. One, um, one pretty straight, so a speaker in front of kind of conceptual space, uh, possibly whiteboard, um, and really trying to define what is real, what is authentic, what is honest, uh, what's permanent, um, what is language. Uh, and then a second direction, which was much more abstract. Um, this is a canvas that I found on the side of the road that had already been painted orange. Uh, and I thought that was a good starting point to say something about whiteboards and um, what's temporary, uh, what sticks even if you don't want it to. And so 
for me, this was, this was partially about um, what our particular practice has, has taken from high art and from street art. Uh, and for me, it was about kind of remixing that and putting it back out. Um, so via Basquiat and then kind of through the corporate boardroom and then back onto the canvas. Um, but this is called Whiteboard. There's a group of people that I work with that I mentioned um, called Presidential Scholars. So every year since 1964, um, the White House has identified and honored um, 100 some students across the country um, as they're graduating high school. And historically, this group of people was uh, brought to Washington, given a medal, and then shown the door, basically, um, kindly, and said, go out and do great things. Um, and the reason this has to do with language for me is uh, at any graduation, they always call it a commencement. And they, they say, this is a beginning, right? Um, and so historically, this, this group of people was the opposite of a group of people. It was a bunch of individuals. Uh, and some of them started saying, well, we should really think of ourselves as a community instead. Um, and so they formed an alumni association. And now we're taking that one step further um, and creating an academy. And the idea is trying to actually honor that word commencement and a beginning. The really exciting thing about this for me is that starting with President Carter, uh, there have been 20 art students involved in this. And there's absolutely no distinction between the ones that are considered having come from an academic background and the ones coming from an arts background. Um, and so there's a community of 6,000 people out there, uh, varying in age from 18 on up to people who were 18 in 1964. Um, half male, half female, incredibly diverse uh, across class, uh, gender, race, all kinds of things. And so um, this is a community that we're now trying to say, let's, let's begin something together. Um, there's also a strong feeling that, that the arts and creative practice belong in education. Uh, and coming from that group, I think that's possibly powerful. Um, so there you go. Those are, those are things I'm involved with now that I kind of think through the lens of language. So. Now I get to share a couple of things. The, the third sort of angle I took was uh, thinking of language as a creative medium to establish culture. So what are ways in which people play with language? Um, what are things that people do creatively um, that use language as something that they're actually talking about? Um, so the, the first thing to mention, and, and sorry, the, this, this felt to me like this is less at the very highest and very lowest levels. This sort of spans everything in the middle. Um, so I did a session on story, and it's amazing. Everybody talks about story. It's a really powerful concept. Um, for me, the, the central quality of story is that it's, it's implicit connection. So if something is in your story, it's there for a reason. And so for scribing and graphic facilitation, uh, by, by virtue of something being in the rectangle, it belongs there. And so, so that's, that's a connection to me. There's, um, there's something about uh, a narrative defined in a rectangle um, and a connection point that fits when I'm trying to think through an organization of concepts. Um, but there's also things that, that aren't stories uh, and things that aren't narrative. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm in some ways telling you a couple of stories, but this is, this is sort of a fact, 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 thought, try this out, let me ask you something. Um, and there's poetry is another, another angle. And I know John loves poetry, wherever he is. Um, <laughs> he's working on it. And so I just I wanted to read a poem um, by James Wright, and this, this is a fairly famous poem, pretty short. Um, but I thought it was worth doing this, at, at the very least, just for hearing how differently language can function, even just in a room. So I've been saying words this whole time, and I'm going to say some other words. Um, but for me, this is powerful for how, how different it feels. This is called Lying in a Hammock at William Duffy's Farm in Pine Island, Minnesota. Over my head, I see the bronze butterfly asleep on the black trunk, blowing like a leaf in green shadow. Down the ravine, behind the empty house, the cowbells follow one another into the distances of the afternoon. To my right, in a field of sunlight between two pines, the droppings of last year's horses blaze up into golden stones. I lean back as the evening darkens and comes on. A chicken hawk floats over, looking for home. I have wasted my life. 
I mean, do you feel that? Does that feel different to you? To me, that's amazing. I mean, these are words in order, they're sentences, um, but, but that quickly, just through a change in how language functions, um, you can change how you feel. And to me, that's, that's very, very powerful. Um, so that's, that's one direction to go. There's a lot of others. Um, I mentioned that I was in a group who did capoeira in Boston. Has anybody heard of capoeira before or seen it? A lot of you. So I'll start this up, I think. Yeah. So here's capoeira music. It's just, this is uh, born out of um, people who are slaves in Brazil, brought from Africa. Is that starting? There you go. Um, so it's all about inversion. So these are people who are slaves, and they found their own, uh, their own language of creativity. They started this dance, uh, which was also a fight, which was also a game. And they were really hiding things from the people who were their captors. Um, and you'll see these guys playing around. There's a, there's a, and you see that. So, so there's the master, basically, playing with a, a relative newbie. Um, and if you notice, so, so here's the point where they'll, they'll stop. There's, there's definitely structures to this. Um, a lot of it has to do with being upside down and actually changing your world. Um, the words of this song, by the way, uh, I'll tell my master the, the butter has melted and butter is not mine and butter is of the master and butter is not mine and butter is of the master. Butter is of the master, fell into the water and got wet. The butter is of the boss, fell to the ground and poured. The butter is not mine, it's for the child of the master. So it's this really subversive, passive-aggressive act of saying, hey, sorry, the butter fell, you know, not my fault. Um, and so they, they actually created this analog where uh, Catholic um, deities, uh, Catholic God and saints um, received analogs in, in Portuguese. And so they would sing songs and to all outward appearances, uh, they were doing this in a way that was consistent with what their masters wanted, um, but it was, their own, it was their own act of subversion. I'm not going to show this scene from The Wire. Nathan knows why. Um, anybody watch The Wire? Okay. So this is an amazing scene. Uh, it's from the fourth episode of the first season. And uh, Bunk and McNulty uh, are doing their job as characters in a police procedural. And they walk into this room, and the only word that either of them say the whole time is the F word. I'm not going to say it here again. Uh, John might say it, but, um, and so, and so if you have a chance, see this scene, because it really, it, it lets you know what, what kinds of communication, um, uh, what are they really dependent upon, what do you really need. Um, it kind of is making fun of itself at the same time that it's kind of blazing new ground. Very much about language. Uh, here's a little video called CNN Concatenated, there's an artist named Omer Faust, just listen to this. So he took all of this from uh, news anchors and talking heads and cut word by word to create a completely new meaning. <coughs> to me, it's amazing how uh, the frame still speaks and this fact of a talking head still speaks. This, this cuts together really well. It feels, it feels real. It feels like language. And of course, the message is something you would never, ever possibly see on the news. Um, anybody here of Esperanto? Does anybody know that? Yeah? Great. Good for you. So, created in 1877, the idea is this is a language um, that was supposed to be the language of hope. It was supposed to actually link people all across the world and give them something common. Um, there have been two movies, to my knowledge, made in Esperanto. Uh, this one has a very famous person in it, speaking in Esperanto. It's a horror film called Incubus um, from the 60s. Worth hearing. We'll give them a second. So that's William Shatner. So Hitler was terrified of Esperanto. He thought that it was going to be the language of uh, a new Jewish conspiracy. Um, because by virtue of what was actually embedded in this created language, um, the people of the world will all be able to come together and, uh, and sort of be one. Find this movie, it's crazy. 
in honor of uh, David Bowie, who just passed, here is part of his creative process. He would take notes from his notebook and literally cut them up um, with scissors and rework them. Which if you think about the ways that we think about language and intent, So he's saying he used that really as a tool to find new directions and try new things because it got, it got him out of his head. It got him out of things that were uh, what he was trying to do and it let, him, it let him try new directions, which it's amazing if you think about that, that you can actually fool your, your own brain and fool yourself um, to, to make something that you didn't know was in there. Um, so Buble, uh, it would be hard to talk about language and art and creativity without mentioning Michael Buble. So, uh, I'll just put this on. Here's Russian Unicorn, and you can see he's achieving a new edginess through lighting of fluorescence, his body poses, his facial expressions, very hip-hop. Okay, so of course this is not actually what he's singing about. Um, anybody know bad lip reading? Okay, so they, they take this, uh, they remove the audio, and they put their own stuff in based on what it looks like he's saying. So the best part's coming up here. Um, coming down the, here we go. Coming down the aisle. I know you ain't a bitch. So, um, pretty amazing. So, uh, so for me, that's like, that's really exemplary. That's, that's an amazing thing to be able to take something that is, is put out there in the world as a consistent artistic statement by real professionals um, and to actually make something completely different that actually feels better um, just, by, just by changing the language, one part of the language. Um, so there's a, a famous uh, commencement, back to commencement speech given by David Foster Wallace called This Is Water. He did it at Kenyon College in 2005. Um, but I'll steal his setup. It's that uh, two young fish are swimming along and uh, they're swimming along through, through the water and the uh, older fish comes along, swimming the other way, and he says, morning boys, how's the water? And he keeps going, and the two young fish keep swinging and, and swimming, and one of the fish turns to the other one and says, what the hell is water? <laughs> and so, um, and so the, the point there is that some things are so deeply connected that you can't see them, um, because they're your reality. And sometimes the most obvious, closely held things are the hardest to be aware of. So in that vein, um, the fourth direction that I thought of language being possibly relevant for people who are thinking about creativity and who are, who are creatives um, is so embedded in what they do and who they are uh, and their own nature is that they don't even realize it. Um, so there are times, I'll just read this, there are times where it seems impossible to separate language out from our understanding or from human nature itself. And the pull of language, whether we notice it or not, is actually more powerful than our capacity to use it. Um, I heard in film school, uh, and I don't even remember where it was from, but it stuck with me, that uh, you don't speak language so much as language speaks you. Uh, there's a precedent for this. Arguments have been made that problems of philosophy are first, problems rooted in language. Um, and we've probably all heard a lot about the power of frames, um, that people fit new information into the mental models that you already have established. Uh, and even the most convincing facts uh, don't stand a chance against those frames. Um, as you probably know if you tried to convince a friend of something political uh, who doesn't agree with you. Um, so even the simplest, most objective observation, literally how we see the world, has already been pushed through a socially constructed lens by the time that you even notice that you're observing it. So if you conceive of language that way, um, practically indistinguishable from human nature or possibly from our creative connective impulse, then what does that mean? What are the implications for artists, uh, producers of culture, and self-identified creatives? So the hopeful part of me would like to think that there are some really great things on the horizon coming soon uh, as the field of media studies continues to develop more sophisticated ways of understanding communication and integrating with production functions. So as the people who are thinking about media um, decide, yes, we need to be working with people who are making media, and vice versa. Um, as self-organizing communities create and learn together with radically evolved views of ownership, consumption, talent, and tolerance, 
as the conception of creativity itself shifts from an individually situated static quality to one that's social, foundational, innate, and dynamic. Uh, and one area that really feels it might need to reimagine itself, uh, one that we're all deeply invested in, is education and learning. Um, Depict is very involved in, in that sphere. Um, one, of, one of the things that, that makes sense that we've heard a lot is that every system produces exactly the results that it's designed to produce. Um, this is scribing from uh, Nicholas Negroponte, who's the co-founder of the MIT Media Lab. Um, so for him, uh, it's absolutely crazy that the frame that we approach education with is competition. Um, he said it's incredibly damaging. Um, he loves situations where we're combining ages, where you have classrooms of, of mixed age. Um, but it makes you wonder, uh, if you're starting from scratch and trying to design an education, education system or school uh, from the ground up, uh, reflecting on what we already know about creative practice and language, um, where would you begin? So at the very least, the incredibly powerful re real world communication skills that are very difficult to assess quantitatively body language, tone, and context. I, I never experienced those in school, but what if, what if that was a starting point? Um, what if, instead of this competition frame, uh, what does a school look like that is more concerned with some collective result or even one that most highly values an individual's ability to collaborate effectively? Uh, and what does arts education look like when it is viewed as it was historically, as closely aligned with scientific inquiry, when it is valued for both practical applicability and its potential to explore solutions to problems that we don't even know we have yet. So for me, that's about art, both as something um, for its own sake uh, and saying, well, let's explore with this. Let's find ways of pushing boundaries and trying new things just because we need to be, um, and also finding ways that creative practice can be applied to things we're already doing. Um, finally, I guess I'll, I'll just pose a couple questions that it might be helpful to think through um, as creatives. So if everything speaks, what is our capacity to comprehend? What are the questions facing creatives around language today? For example, what does fluency in any number of these new languages look like? What does poetry look like? What does dialogue look like? What does discourse look like? Uh, my boys have a, a game at school, and I, I love this story, where they have this little box um, with holes on the top, and there's like a template on there. Uh, they have this little clear cup and a ball, and they make little circles with this, sorry, sorry microphone, little circles with this ball. It is, the, the goal is to not let it fall into these little holes. And it's this great game, and they trace this thing over and over, and it's this great game. And of course, what are they practicing? Writing. So, so it's, this, it's this thing that they enjoy. Uh, they're learning, their body is learning. Um, but it's, it, to them, from their point of view, that's an unintended consequence. Um, so the analog for me is that, uh, and this is, this is something that maybe interests me more than any of you, but we have this whole community of scribes out there, graphic facilitators. Um, it's been shown that when you write something down and draw a picture, you remember it better, you learn it more deeply. We have all these people who have been scribing all these sessions and learning about all these crazy things all over the world for 15 or 20 years, uh, basically learning in the most effective method that we know how. Um, and so what's the unintended consequence? Uh, what does that community look like? What types of things might we do? How can we share what we've learned? Um, how can we advocate for a particular form of education? Um, what are the implications for critical and media studies uh, as they become more aware of production practices uh, and vice versa? And finally, how do you choose to spend your creative time and energy? Um, one of the things, if you're creative, that you think about a lot is who your audience is. And if, are, you, are you meeting them? Are you kind of putting out into the world what you want to put and see if they get it? Um, I, th I think for me, there's, there's some balance there, uh, and that's something that I think it takes some time to come to. Um, but in this context, what is called for a new vocabulary, a new language? Is this less about the answer and more about engaging with the question? Um, and I'll end, and this is amazing, but these name tags. So this is the uh, Esperanto word for peace, patzon. I didn't know they were going to do that, but there you go. Patzon, everybody. <laughs> Thanks. So I think there's some time for questions, if anybody has any. Yes?
Sure. So um, thanks for asking that. So there's there's actually the first get together that I know of that's really open to this whole community is happening this coming summer in California. Um, so we'll see what comes of that. But I guess the potential, the interesting thing there is that I, I have no idea what what these other people have experienced. Um, our exposure to things tends to be uh, very intense and brief, uh, and so we get all these tiny little snapshots. Um, and, and thinking through that as a way of learning, I think, is really interesting. Uh, I would imagine that there will be groups of people who have latched on to some piece of what they've learned, and it might be cool to get them together in, in little pods, uh, parts of a network. Um, I'll just add that I recently scribed a session. Uh, this was like the, the one that was most out there. So this was Harvard Center for Integrated Quantum Materials. Right. <laughs> and so obviously I, I didn't know any of the science of what they were doing. I learned a lot about kind of what's on the horizon and the types of problems that they have and things they're working through. Um, it would be interesting to me to see if anything that they are working on and any principles that they're thinking about might possibly have implications for other groups working on things. Um, just finding that cross-pollination and thinking through these scribes who have been exposed to all these things over the years as the glue uh, and the possible connective tissue between those things. That's exciting. I have no idea where it might head. Yeah. So how did you, what was your path to get to this reflection? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Sure. So the question is, what, what's the path to become a graphic facilitator or scribe or doodler or sketch noter? So, um, Everybody has their own way there. Uh, it's, it's historically, and this is kind of what I was saying, like no two people got there the same way. I'll just say that the way I got into it is that I was playing records in the studio one night, and thank goodness our walls didn't go all the way up to the ceiling because the woman in the next studio over liked the music I was playing and knocked on the door and we started talking. Um, and it turns out that was Kelly Bird, who's one of my business partners now, and she said, hey, you should talk to this guy. Um, and so it's, historically it's been very much being in the right place at the right time and then being able to embrace something and be flexible. I would say that's quality-wise way more important than being able to draw. It's nice if you can draw, um, but it's much more about being flexible and trying things out and connecting things. Uh, the other thing is you can just try this. You know, it's, 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 so, it's such a flexible form. There's nothing preventing you from, from trying this out. So listen to the news, listen to a radio or podcast. Um, try it. Um, the, the most important point here for me is that, yes, it's a profession. Um, I would love to find out what it looks like if it's integrated through other professions. What does it look like when you put this into hospitals and have doctors and nurses using this as a way of understanding things? Um, what does it look like in education for schools? Uh, so there's a lot of potential there that is as yet untapped. John. Mm. How, how hard sure. was it to get to that? I'll tell you, that's such a good question. I'll tell you I'm an awful multitasker. Kara, my wife can tell you this. I'm, I'm a really, really bad multitasker. So the thing to me is that it, it does not feel like different things. Um, I'd say that it feels like a core activity of listening. Uh, the reflecting and drawing and producing becomes extremely automatic. Um, if you're not, just like you said, if you're not listening, you're not, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And so there comes a point where the activity of framing things and connecting things in your head really just kind of naturally gets expressed on a board. I'd say my, my business partner, Kelvy, has some fantastic writing on what this all feels like. Um, and so I can uh, provide you all with a link for that. The, the thing I'd say is that uh, practice helps. Um, but with time, it, it doesn't feel like you're trying to do two different things at once. Does that answer what you're asking? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. Cool. <laughs> Do you ever feel like you're missing something? Sure. Yeah. So um, it's happened that I've just finished drawing something. This might counter what I just said to John, but I'm just finishing drawing something, and I'll hear a speaker say, and so really that's the most important thing. <laughs> And if you all leave here, and then he starts, you know, and if you all leave here today, that's the one thing I need you all to remember. I'm like, come on, please say it again. You're gonna say that and not say it again. Um, so typically though, what people do, and I don't think this is out of consideration for me, what people do is they'll say, hey, I'm gonna tell you something, and this is pretty important. Da 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 da. So what I just told you was da 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 da, which is pretty important. Da da da, and they'll say it again. So they, they say their important stuff more than once. 
usually. Um, there's also, in that point about tone and context and body language, um, when people are saying something that's the most important thing, they'll let you know through those other cues. And so tone changes very much when somebody is hitting what they consider to be their most important thing. Um, so yes, I miss stuff. Every now and then I'll misspell things. Um, people are pretty forgiving. That's the other thing, is that when they see what you've done, and typically for a lot of people too, this, this is foreign to them, and so they'll, they'll say, wow, this is amazing. Just so you know, that's totally wrong. Can you change it to, <laughs> you know? So yeah, people are forgiving, but it happens. Yeah, great question. So uh, as much as possible, and I would say that I'm, I'm trying to do more and more of that. Um, so what Megan's asking about is, yes, exactly that uh, sort of disjointed feeling of literally flying around the world to go do something that feels like you're uh, you know, in a room that might be changing things globally, and then coming back and, and working on a street corner with somebody to craft a poem for them. So it's a, I love that feeling. I love being able to feel like those things are connected in some way. Um, it's not easy sometimes, because sometimes you'll, you'll get attached to one of those modes more than the other and really want to keep working that way. Um, ideally, these are systems that aren't disconnected. And so for me, uh, things that might happen and get incubated and grown here in Cincinnati could possibly get fed back into a larger system and vice versa. There's an awful lot that I've learned through working with some of these larger groups and international scenes um, that already, in subtle ways or not so subtle ways, uh, we've, we've tried to incorporate and do here in Cincinnati. And I think that has a lot to do with learning and sharing um, and how communities work and how, how language is productive. Um, yeah. Thanks. One more question. Colleen. Maybe. <laughs> you know, just your experience working with youth and your impressions from them and, and what that can continue to look like and sure. how you continue to plan to work in that space. Yeah, definitely. If, I'm curious if you mentored or, or taught them to get involved and hands on in or if it's right. you know, even some facilitating. Yeah, so right. Great question. This is this is something that um, we ask ourselves a lot, especially um, at Depict, where we say, okay, if we're really invested in education, what does that look like at all ages, um, systemically and individually? And so we think about, yeah, kindergartens. Um, what, what might kids be able to do? There's something called Camp Snowball that uh, Kelvy's been involved with on the Northwest Coast um, that actually teaches kids systems thinking and system mapping. Um, and so to me, that says that there's, there's certainly potential for kids to start learning this language early, the same way that we talk about learning Spanish early as being a good way to do it. Um, it's something that has so far remained pretty small scale. Uh, I would love to find out, you know, I'd love to see, hey, when kids have this tool at their disposal, do they start describing their world differently? Does their art change? Um, do they start thinking about uh, what they're learning in school differently? Um, one of the things that has been shown is that uh, people who are listening and drawing, no matter what they're drawing, uh, they learn more deeply that way. And so it would be, to me, it feels like there's possibly a steep part of that curve that we might put some things in people's hands and let them run with it, um, and that it might do a lot of good pretty quickly. So hopefully we'll find out. Thank you. Is that it? All right, thanks everybody.